24-year-old uh, Paul Cohen went to Hartley Rogers, the uh, well-known MIT logician, and asked him, what's the best problem in logic? Of course, Hartley, without hesitation, said, the undecidability of the continuum hypothesis. I don't know if this story is true, but I do know that a few years later, Paul Cohen did succeed in proving the undecidability of CH, one of the landmark results, perhaps the most famous result of logic uh, after Gödel. Uh, the technique that Professor Cohen developed to do this, the method of forcing, uh, is today then the second of the three most uh, important techniques in set theory. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Paul Cohen, who's titled My Interaction with Kurt Gödel, the Man of the Floor. How about this work? Well, let me apologize in the sense this is not a standard talk. I'm not going to present any astounding things, predictions of the future, uh, analogies with the, the right brothers or anything like that. I mean, it's a personal talk. And I must say that I was rather moved last night, especially when they played Hoffman, Tales of Hoffman, the Buffalo, and to think that Gerdel uh, enjoyed that music. And as I would explain, uh, it, was, it was a great pleasure for me to have sitting at the table of Professor Hilary Putnam, who I knew about at the time I did my work, and he jogged my memory about things about her, and I, I, I will come back to this. Let me, what he said about her was interesting, uh, I think it would be universally agreed. The girl was a fragile person, and the people who knew him sort of took care of her. We felt, one, one definitely felt responsible in this morning. But for me, it was a tremendously emotional thing to meet him, to show him my results. And I, I want to apologize for my talk because I think in the ultimate analysis, it will be incomprehensible <coughs> to people who are at least mathematicians and many if they're not set theorists. I'll try to explain the feeling of the time, the emotion, because no other word suffices to explain it. It was with deep emotion that I saw her and uh, told him my result. Uh, uh, as I said in my abstract, his work is so well known, especially in the beautiful collection, the collective works, which was edited, chief editor was my colleague, Saul Pfefferman, which was done at Stanford, which has not only his collective works, but autobiographical material and wonderful notes given the origin of each paper. So there's no point in me really discussing that. This talk, this talk will be personal, and it'll be about me at least as much as about Kurt Gerl. So I'm not sure that I want to take questions at the end of it, since I, I don't want to talk about personal things more than I intend to do in the talk. Um, so one of the points I want to mention was that, OK, so how many influence me? So I have to tell you a little bit about what I'm interested in set theory. These stories, for example, did you say, oh, maybe true, but I that I, some people came up to me and essentially said that form, that story in a slightly different form. And we were, we were talking about truth. And I said, what does it matter when the story is true? You're going to continue to tell it, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no matter what I say, so go ahead, you know. You can do it at my expense. It's a good story. Let's keep telling it. Uh, it's possible that I said that. When you say it to me, it does ring a very, very dim bell. It's possible that something like that happened. Uh, Okay, so I want to tell you a little about my history, which is well known to most people who know me. I wrote my thesis at the University of Chicago under Professor Anthony Sigmund, and as fate would have it, I wrote my thesis on the very topic which George Cantor was interested in when he discovered set theory, namely the theory of uniqueness of expansions in trigonometric series. But I had no real interest in set theory. I do remember Sigmund posed as a problem to me. Uh, a technical problem which he thought would be of a set theoretical nature about the union of two sets of uniqueness not being a set of uniqueness if they were closed, that was known. But he had a theory that uh, sets more complicated than closed sets might be able to compensate it. I really had no idea how to do it, so I essentially never worked on it. So I worked in analysis, and my interest really was to a great extent analysis and number theory. And I achieved some success, I guess. One of the privileges of age and having to give these talks, I can brag a little bit. So before this work, it was wonderful. 
achievement for me when I got the book Shade Prize in analysis and a letter from a wonderful English mathematician, um, Harold Davenport. Finally, he, he didn't know who I was, and I had made an announcement of this Littlewood conjecture result. And he asked an Englishman, as soon as he died, I was in Chicago, do you know this fellow? And he said, yeah, I've met him since the a company student. But I'll never forget the letter he wrote to me. He said, dear Professor Cohen, if your result is correct, or something like that, you have the satisfaction of knowing you have solved a problem which has defeated a generation of British analysts. And that, that, that was a compliment which I never forgot. It was a anyway. So I didn't really think about logic much with one very, very big exception, and that is this. I like number theory, and in high school, the first year of college, I read a book by Tawdy and Wright, Theory of Numbers, a lovely book, and um, I particularly like the part about partitions, uh, decompositions into squares, and you get a feeling that Jacobi and those early people had developed almost the calculus of the infinite power series expansions for which they deduced many of these wonderful results. So the thought began to occur to me, was that the calculus of power series, which could reduce every question of this type, in the same sense that there's a decision procedure for polynomials. And I had read almost no logic. So I thought about it, and I was very, I thought I was making progress. What I essentially was doing was rediscovering how to formalize number theory elementary types about recursive functions. I was very happy with myself. And I came to the University of Chicago and told people this was my dream. Uh, well, there weren't many students who were into logic then, and there was nobody in the faculty, with the exception perhaps of Saunders and McLean, who had written pieces in logic, essentially hadn't kept up with the subject in many, many years. And some of the students said, well, we think this is what is Gertel's theorem. I said, what's Gertel? I said, well, Gertel's theorem is a theorem of philosophy. It has nothing to do with concrete problems in number theory. I just couldn't believe it. So they said, well, McLean is going to come and give a lecture. So Queen came, and there was a team that was so very great professor. You only saw him at tea time. And so there was a tea, and I walked up to the professor. I went to ask him a question. He said, well, what is it you want to do? And I told him, and then in a very firm voice, he said, no, that's impossible. I have nothing to buy with Curtis Theory. So I thought it was time to read Curtis Theory. But I still was very dreamy, so I got Queen's book, which was about something about mathematics. I read it, and I mean, I started to read that section. And I still had the impression that nobody could prove something about number theory by reasoning about general things about what is true, what is a proof. And so I read it, sketched it, and for a few days, I was convinced it was wrong. And I went up to one of the older students and said, look, I found a mistake. And he was rather contemptuous. And after a few days, of course, I realized that his proof was right. Uh, but it was, it was almost uh, elating at the same time almost, almost uh, depressing to think that this man was so superior to me that by thinking in the most general terms he could derive a result which, which had tremendous implications for number theory, or at least the kind of things I wanted to do. So he was my master. I mean, the name of Gerdel, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't, still wasn't too interested in logic. Cleany's book, maybe somebody can correct me, had very little about set theory. And uh, I couldn't even find a reference to his complete, to his result on constructible sets, other than the Princeton monograph, which I was talking with Billy Putnam, is notoriously opaque. And one of the minor offshoots of my work is I felt that people lost their fear of that monograph. <laughs> they saw, well, you can actually work with this stuff. But it was very difficult to read. Uh, actually, Sullivan, in the collected works, discusses why he thinks Gertle wrote it in such an incomprehensible way. But so he was. He was a very meticulous person. So I was lying in bed, not being able to sleep, still suffering from jet lag. And I thought, well, I need some jokes. I need some literary references. And some thoughts came back to me in my, in my bed, in my strange state. And I remembered I had an English teacher in New York City, Mr. Salerman, who was a great admirer of the essays of Francis Bacon. I think many of you are from Anglo-Saxon background, so we know, of course, the essays of Francis Bacon. And he wrote one of his essays called Of Truth. And what does he say? What is truth, said Pontius Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. So that was the discussion of truth. But there's another concept of truth which occurred to me 
And that is another one of my heroes in my late teenage years was the novelist Marcel Proust. He said, what is memory? The truth of memory, you know, something is gone, long gone, but is the memory the truth of what happened? And I feel that way of Gertle. When I heard that music, it actually made me feel quite emotional. And uh, I thought, well, he heard this music, and uh, he really liked it. And I never discussed music with him, because I think it was said it was his favorite piece. And so, so suddenly his image came back to me. The other weird feeling I must tell you, uh, there's a lovely exhibit on Gertle. I will say something, perhaps I shouldn't. My wife is probably shaking her head right now. I think it's a lovely exhibit with one, one very bad exception. I don't think references to his wife were at all appropriate, and I think they should have been omitted completely. Anyhow, uh, I was walking down the steps, and suddenly I saw this locker on the steps. It said in German, on this spot was murdered Professor Schlick, I always forget his name. And it sort of sent chills up my spine, partly because I'm Jewish and I thought, well, he was murdered by the Nazis. It wasn't quite correct. But there was also was a weird similarity that I had a colleague who was murdered by a deranged student also, called Lou. And so that also gave me a very, a very strange feeling. So the question is, what kind of truth? What do you mean by truth? Well, well, one thing we discussed at the panel the other day was how many people were formalists, how many people were realists. Realists are those who believe that the abstract world of sets exists and every statement is either true or false. I want to propose something which I'm sure will be hotly uh, poo-pooed by people like Hugh Wooden. But I think in my work we have an alternative thing. We have many universes and they're very rich and they involve mathematical complications. Uh, Cy Freeman refers to the fact that Kirtle's work on set theory involved mathematical technique. Well, I'm teaching a course right now on set theory, and I found it hard to remember some of the details. So my work really did get into some tricky points. And so now we have to construct all these universes, and in some sense I'm very happy with that. I don't claim that this in itself initiates the program of people who want to, uh, who want to describe it. Well, so anyhow, I came to Chicago and I read Girdle's Proof, and I felt a little bit depressed by it, but I said, I better stop thinking about the decision procedure for diaphragmatic equations, because this fellow seems to have done to show it's impossible. So I stopped thinking about that. And I did come back to set theory, or to logic, really. I did look a little bit further in Queen's book, and there was a group of people, not a very large group, including Raymond Smullyan, the author of a very funny uh, paradox yesterday, which I written down I intend to tell it as soon as possible. So in analogy with my remark about don't worry if the story is true, it's a good story, just tell it. I'm thinking of a wonderful remark of Oscar Wilde when at a dinner party a woman said to him, ah, Mr. Wilde, that was a wonderful uh, bon mot you got off. I wish I had said it. And he said, don't worry, madam, you will. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyhow, I love that paradox. And uh, at that time, there was this, uh, there was great interest amongst Raymond and some other people about host crop. And that's a problem which could have, could have interested me, it had a mathematical flavor to it. But I, I never thought about it. And occasionally we'd have coffee and I'd hear these, these people talk about it. But one day, someone came to my office and said, this problem's been solved. And I said, really? Yes, here's the letter, but I, I can't believe it's true. And uh, he gave it to me and I read it and I went to the blackboard, took some chalk. I said, well, it seems right, it seems clever. This was the, the proof by Friedberg. And so that was my only contact with logic at that point. Uh, but I still never lost this idea of uh, somehow thinking about the foundations of mathematics, trying to find some kind of inductive technique for simplifying compositions, perhaps leading to a decision to which is impossible. So if the story about Harley Frank is uh, Hartley Rogers is true, it probably corresponds to that period we were discussing logic. I do remember meeting Azriel Levy, who was visiting MIT. We had a brief discussion. Again, he rather poo-pooed what he thought was my naive ideas about how to think about mathematics. And so the man stood until I came to uh, Stanford. And at that time, I had actually left harmonic analysis. I was working in differential equations primarily. But somehow the bug had bit me. I wasn't aware of when, when the bite happened. 
but something had happened, and I couldn't get the idea that I had a way of thinking about the foundations of mathematics, and so I gave some lectures about my ideas of how to build up a consistency proof. But again, I felt a deep sense of frustration. I remember one day, shading and looking at myself in the mirror, and I said, you poor fellow, you're driving yourself nuts. You'll never be able to do this. You think your ideas are correct. You're just never going to get anywhere with it. So I felt rather depressed. But nevertheless, um, they stuck. And now some people ask me, I use the word intuition in mathematics, and I believe very strongly that great mathematics comes, is simple in some sense, comes as a flash. Rather early in the game, I think forcing occurred in a very, very easy form to me, but I didn't know what I had. And uh, I told this story somewhere. I met my wife at that time, and we took a long trip. I wanted to show her the United States. She had come from Sweden. We took a long trip to the Grand Canyon, to the various national parks. And as I was driving, I did a very dangerous thing. I thought hard about that the whole time. <laughs> and during that time, the idea became clearer. Okay, but I don't remember. Now, at this point, my uh, histiography, if that's the word, is not quite accurate. At some point, I got a hold of uh, Gödel's Princeton monograph. But I think I mostly looked at it for the state of the axioms. I wasn't really sure what the axioms were. And um, I tried to read it, I didn't understand it. And I, again, I felt, well, this is a very ponderously written tome. It has nothing to do with what I'm trying to do. And, um, but eventually, of course, I did start thinking about constructing models for universes. And then I realized, aha, construction. This is what Gödel was doing. And so I did, the whole thing came together, and of course I eventually learned the technique, and it's the cornerstone of my own work. Uh, now, uh, the other thing, as rumor had it, I don't know, just the stories about me circulating, stories about girdles, about girdles circulating with great rapidity. And it wasn't just a story that he had told people, as Church mentioned during the Moscow conference when I was awarded the Fields Medal, that girl claimed to solve the problem of the unprovability of the axiom of choice, but not of the continuum hypothesis. Nobody knew the method, and to this day nobody knows. But after I got to know him in my rather rash way, I asked him point blank, did you solve it? And he came right back and said, yes. And I said, what was your method? Well, he said it was somewhat similar to yours. And that was the end of the entire conversation. I never got a clue. Um, of what he thought. And I will come back to this point, but there was a there was a slight sadness about my relation with Gertel that we didn't communicate more um, than I wanted to. Uh, now on the notes that I wrote up for this, I wanted to say that one of my interests in logic came from the fact I was reading the book by Edmund Mandel, Four Lazy with Eva Tavantili. And the greatest theorem in that book I thought was a theorem of what is they call the, the two is eagle theorem, which has about approximation and also a theorem of diagonal analysis, the fact that certain equations only find many solutions, and the method is non-constructive. And this irritated me no end. Uh, I just thought there's something wrong with the way that mathematics is set up if you hit if you hit this point. So that was also in the back of my mind. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then, uh, as I said, I strongly recommend the collected works of Gödel for those who want to uh, discuss these points. But so, so what's the history of Gödel's work in set theory? Approximately 1938, I think he found his uh, basic result. Did he think of it as an independence result? I'm not sure. I tend to think he thought that the notion of constructible sets he didn't say this, but he thought that those were the right sets, quote unquote. I don't think he ever expressed in print that he believed that the axiom of constructibility was true and should be taken as an axiom, although somebody said perhaps he did briefly. I don't know. But I, I would have to take issue a little with what Sai said. I don't think he saw it as a mathematical uh, uh, ex exercise or uh, an, ex uh, an exercise in mathematical ingenuity. According to his collected works, the point, the hardest point of this proof is to show that in the constructible sets, the continuum hypothesis holds. 
And if I'm not mistaken, this took him two years, and he was under great mental strain when he did it. It's hard for us to understand these things today because now when you teach a course, everything becomes compressed. You give it as an exercise or something, you know. But everything was very much hard at the beginning. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing where Hurdle's writings impinged on my thinking there was this famous article on what is Kant's continuum problem. I was intrigued by this article, but probably not for the reason most people would think in the sense that I learned something from him. He really doesn't give any, he doesn't give any details. But what struck me most was the way he thought about it, this extremely realist view that he seemed to have a wonderful insight into what mathematics really should be. And I, and I really wanted to find out what that is. And I think I've mentioned this to people. When I got to know him better, I did have the audacity to ask him point blank, where does your faith come from that all all problems in mathematics should be solvable once you think of the right axioms. And he, I don't remember his words exactly, but he said something about, well, I couldn't really believe in Western civilization unless I thought so. I think Angus told me, were you the one who referred to Russell, that he was influenced by the work of Russell? I, I did. Oh, you, who was that? Oh, yes, excuse me, Hillary did. Yeah, yeah that, that the German philosophy of Russell had a big effect on him. All these things were very, strange to me because I am not a philosopher. As a matter of fact, I would say I have an antipathy to philosophy, which started as a young age and has remained with me to a large extent. Although, naturally, I, everyone who's thought about the foundations of mathematics has their own philosophy about it. Uh, so, anyhow, I started to work on this and after my famous trip with my wife-to-be, I started to think about it. And then the idea, well, I had him on wrote this book where he said he stepped on the bus and he got his ideas about uh, automorphic functions. I remember quite well the day I said, my God, this thing is crazy, but it actually seems to work. I thought that the notion of forcing was on a knife's edge. It seemed to be nonsensical because you were trying to construct a model where things were to be true. You don't know what the model is. You use what you want to be true as the basis for constructing the model. You don't know what truth is. And so conscious pilot statement had particular meaning to me. Um, uh, then I see there was another quota quotation from, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, so I began to think this way, and suddenly I realized that the whole thing held together. I couldn't believe it. And there was one young visitor from Wales, as a matter of fact, who wasn't a magician. But we were quite friendly with him. He was a very good musician. We shared that interesting comment. And I said, David, you must come over. I want to tell you something. And he came over and I said, look, it's really basically two lines. Uh, those of you who know what forcing is, where you distinguish between the case of universal versus existential quantum part. He had no idea what he was talking about. And I think he thought I was slightly mad. But um, nevertheless, I knew at that point nothing could stop me. And so I, I wrote it up. And then, the history of this is not entirely clear to me. I felt that the people I knew in California weren't really particularly receptive to it. I don't really know why exactly what the history was. I don't think anybody said it was wrong exactly. But I said, I've got to go see the master. And so very quickly, I remember being in the dentist chair, and the dentist said to me, you're going to see Kurt Bird, aren't you? I said, how oh, do you know? He said, well, my previous patient was a student of the medical department. <laughs> so I had told people that I definitely had to go see him. So I arrived at Princeton with a preprint, and uh, he wasn't there, but I went to his house, and I, uh, I gave him the preprint, and he, I don't remember. This, this story has also been elaborated enormously, how we see him in his house, etc., etc. But then I say, go ahead, tell your stories. It's sort of the analog, who is the English who said probably shouldn't be damned? Was that uh, the Duke of Wellington, or was it uh, Lord Nelson, I think? <laughs> the Duke of Wellington, okay. So, go ahead, tell your stories about me, that's fine. But anyhow, uh, for one story I do want to take this public occasion to, uh, to uh, debunk, so to speak, because it's amazing how people get things mixed up. Um, there was one of the few logicians, logic students, in Chicago it was a young man who I don't think I had much contact with. But when I arrived at Princeton, I met Dean Montgomery, and he said, what are you doing here? Because I had been at Princeton the year before. 
And he said, I'm coming to see Kurt Gerdler. I said, about what? And I told him what I had done. He said, well, that's amazing. You'll have to give a talk about it. I said, I really don't want to. I really haven't gotten anyone to say authoritatively that it's correct. He said, it doesn't matter. You're going to give a talk. So it was on a weekend. They hastily assembled these people. In the audience was Robert Salome. He understood the method immediately. He became one of the foremost exponents of it. And, uh, well, anyhow, and, uh, this uh, magician fellow I knew from Chicago saw me and he talked to me and he drove me over to Gerdel's house. But he wrote it up and I looked at his website and he said, although Paul Cohen wouldn't want to admit it now, when I knew him as a student, he was trying to prove number theory was inconsistent. So this was total news to me. I never thought that this was inconsistent. But he said I was actively engaged in trying to find a contradiction. You know, he somehow just got mixed up. Maybe he heard I was thinking about trying to get a decision to see. But as far as I know, I never would have been a math student if I actually thought mathematics was inconsistent. But nevertheless, it's in print, and uh, I, may, I may send an email sometime to ask him to correct it on his website. Uh, now, uh, I want to say something about the distinction between mathematical ability and philosophy. I think what did impress me about her, although again, in retrospect, it's hard to understand anything, how difficult it was for human time, was the fact that he so quickly answered this question of von Neumann. Von Neumann, who was, who was a brilliant person, very quick reputed to be the quickest mathematician of his generation. When he heard of Gerdel's results, on one hand, he understood it, the incompleteness there. On the other hand, he said to him, do you think you could get the statement to be a statement in arithmetic? And as most people know, this was the beginning of, Hilbert, of the work on Hilbert's tenth problem, I got mixed up, which is the one about the diagram, right? Ten. 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 It is a ten, okay. <laughs> and he, not very complicated, but very cleverly, did show that they could almost be reduced to diagram equations. And I was quite amazed by that. I said, this guy is not only a great thinker, but when he faces a problem in number theory, he just devours it, he just plows right through it. So that made a very strong impression on him. Anyhow, so I went to see Gerdel, and in a few days, I don't remember exactly how many days, he said to me, well, the result was correct. So there was a tremendous feeling of relief. And now, I just want to say a little bit, perhaps this is not common, I want to tell you a little bit about the emotions I felt about meeting Gerdel. I mean, the intensity was enormous in some sense. I just felt that I had made contact with someone, and that now, and I was in some sense a worthy, I was the next generation, but I was worthy of him. This sounds almost, uh, you know, I think it's the word, attitudinous to say, but I definitely felt that, that I had gone beyond him, and that his approval meant an enormous amount to me. Uh, uh, so, now I want to tell you some negative aspects. The negative aspect was that he didn't seem to want to discuss the details of the proof. I don't understand why, uh, but, but Hillary Putnam, in a way, contradicted me last night because I sent a copy to Hillary, and Hillary thought he found a snag in the verification of one of the axioms. I vaguely recall that too, I don't remember what the snag was, but when he asked uh, Gerdel about it, he also thought there was a snag in the group. Gerdel believed he said, no, you can get around that. So, he, so Hillary has the impression he was quite vigorous. But I tried to talk to him, and um, then I went to Princeton, maybe the next academic year, for about six months. And that's when I saw him on a regular basis. And uh, he it wasn't, it seemed to be interested in the details of the method. As far as I can recall, my memory is in no way perfect, he was mostly concerned about what it said to him about the nature of the universe. But I can tell you, for example, one thing, that when I first gave him the paper, this was a hastily written preprint, there was a somewhat small point, a gap, not in the correctness, but I constructed a model where C was greater than L of 2. But I couldn't prove that uh, greater than equal to L of 2. I did prove that it was L of 2. It was very easy to see it was either L of 2 or L of 3 in this model. And I guess I was so happy with having shown this, I didn't bother to think any further. And Gerdel never asked me anything about it, you know. Well, in a week or two, Salome told me he had decided it, but I decided but in a, in the method that I used was so similar to Gödel's method to showing that C equals L of 1 in the constructible sets that it was a mystery to me why he didn't pursue it. He didn't uh, 
He didn't try to give me any ideas. He didn't even didn't seem to express that in his interest. So if I can say a little personal thing, the general impression I had of Berl was that he was exhausted, he was a bit feeble. He didn't want to think about difficult technical points. Uh, and when I, I think I mentioned this in one of the interviews, I would say to him, well, when I see you next week, Professor Berl, he, 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 he was very friendly and very nice and very cordial. He said something, well, what about in two weeks, he said. <laughs> so about once every two weeks, an hour discussion. I have to think that that was all he really wanted to get involved with. But I felt extremely close to him, and uh, I wish... Now, another mathematician who died recently was Serge Lang, and I contributed a little bit to the uh, memorial uh, thing for him. And I said something again, which is, I knew him as a graduate student, but he had a, he had a big effect on my life. He was powerhouse of energy who showed up at Chicago, lectured on everything under the sun, algebraic geometry, class field theory, which was one of my main interests was actually algebraic number theory. And, uh, and I said there, of course, if you know who Serge Lang is, you know that he's had quarrels with everybody in the universe about every conceivable topic. And I said in this little short edition to the remark, I said I felt a little sadness when I heard he died, that I was never able to sort of say, you know, sort of take it easy. Don't get into all these fights, it's not worth it. But of course, he wouldn't have listened to me anyhow. I felt similarly with Gerdo. I wish I could have, in some sense, uh, I don't know, had a, an effect on him. But by that time, his, the, the pattern of his life was already set. Um, so I also want to say something a little bit which contradicts the tone of many of the talks where they talk about Gerdelian, they make it sound like he did these incredibly complex things. That's not true. He was a man of great intuition. Almost all of his theorems were, you might say, insightful theorems, which you can understand in a moment or two. Again, a little bit, in a little bit egotistic, but I say my work is not that way. You could believe, perhaps, that forcing is going to work, but you cannot see the ramifications of it until you really get down and thinking about it. And the other, so my other disappointment, so I would like to tell you my feeling that, that the greatness of Gödel was this insightfulness. If I can use some other silly, overblown analogies, it's almost like he saw, is it the Bible where Moses has to turn his face away from God because of the blinded him or something? I felt that he thought about things that were almost too much for him somehow thinking that he had analyzed the notion of truth. Perhaps it affected his mental state. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's well known that he had mental problems. Uh, but uh, it's, it's almost as if... But anyhow, I thought I was talking to a man that we had both traveled down the same road. It's not a happy road entirely. It's a road of deep, deep frustration and pessimism. I told you the instant where I remember looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you poor SOB, if I can use that. What are you doing thinking about these questions that you're never going to get anywhere with? Uh, and I think that he must have had his dark moments too. Uh, but I have a different mentality. I wish we could have been closer, but I said in a previous lecture we came from extremely different backgrounds, extremely different temperaments, and we never could have been close in that sense. But he was always extremely kind to me. Even though I felt it was an effort, even a one-hour chat once every two weeks, I felt it exhausted him. But he, you know, he was extremely kind about it. And uh, so I always remember that about him. Uh, but I do have this feeling that, uh, so people talk about unknowability and all that. I, I don't know if that's the way he thought about it. I think he felt that he was making progress. He discovered things, but that it was... He saw the light, and the light was a bit blinding almost. Because I can only say, at the risk of being a little bit over, over emotional, it was, it was frightening almost when I did my own work that suddenly I could construct all these universes. I, I, almost, I just couldn't believe it that you could do this much. And that was undoubtedly why other people also were a little bit hesitant to admit that I was totally correct. Uh, Uh, another point of historical interest, I saw in a book, perhaps it was Gregory Moore's book on Harrison Choice, in which he had a reference to Skolem, in which he said, Skolem anticipated my method. And my first reaction was, what are you saying? I mean, of course, I was hurt by this. 
but by God, I looked up the reference in the school and had some amazing, prescient thoughts. And I felt, I made a joke with somebody that if, if Gertel was my great father figure, Torvald Skullen was <laughs> the wise elder brother for me. He understood logic in a very direct way. And in my opinion, he was a plain old-fashioned mathematician. He had worked in diagram and equations, periodic analysis, algebras, simple algebras, etc. And he approached it in a very matter-of-fact way. And when I read this thing, he actually says, he talks about constructing different models of set theory. And he said, of course, the interesting thing would be to introduce a set of integers which had new properties. He discussed rather, I might use the word, trivial ways of constructing new models using general techniques, the skull of everything. But he said, of course, the interesting thing would be to introduce a new set of integers. But he sort of says, I have no idea how to do this. When I read this, I almost got a shot. Unfortunately, he died about the very year when my work came out. And I, I've been friendly with Dr. Finn Ferdestal, Norwegian math visitor who comes to Stanford often. And he said he was Skolem's last student. And I said, did he ever meet Gerber? He said, no, he was a very shy man, although he visited the United States. He never picked up the phone and said, Court, do you think we could get together some weekend? Because uh, Skolem had also very strong philosophical views, but very different. At one point, he thought about models. I looked at Gerber's work, and the word model does not appear very often, because he was well aware of it. I would say he emphasizes the syntactical approach, which means, for those of you who aren't experts in the subject, you could say that to show that a certain system of axioms is consistent or a certain thing can be proved, this is a purely formless statement about how what can be proved using finite numbers of deduction. I very quickly said, despite my formless conviction, you'll never get anywhere this way. The integers, the sets exist. Uh, for all practical purposes, you better be talking about sets and not talking about sentences. But I don't think Gertl, I would have loved if Gertl had said to me, you know, interesting that you concentrated on models. So I should mention something else that as a function of my personality, I finally started thinking about set theory more seriously. I had this little book. I couldn't penetrate it. I got the axioms from it. But I started thinking about constructing models for set theory. And then I said, so this must be talking about. And I looked at the book, and sure enough, he had the notion of constructability. But soon after that, in my rash way, well, to, to excuse myself, I must say how old I was, how old was I? I was 26, I guess. I said, you know, Gertle made a mistake. In what sense? Well, his construction is not correspond to what most mathematicians would call a construction. If I asked you to construct a ring, you would say, okay, a ring has zero and one, it has one plus one, one plus it has three, it has four, and then if you give me a field, it has four shifts, and you get the rational numbers. But Gernot didn't do that. He did not construct what I call the minimal model of set theory. His construction was too generous. And I was rather happy with that result, although I didn't think it was too really profound. I later found out that Shepherdson had found the result a few years earlier, but hadn't, uh, according to Martin Davis, didn't attract much attention, because one of the results of this method shows that Gerbel's construction, or anything like it, could never prove the negation of the continuum hypothesis being independent. Uh, there was no inner model. And I think if people had understood that, they would have tried my ideas earlier. They would have said, you're not going to do it by playing with sentences. You better work with models. Again, retrospection seems very easy, but People thought that was strange. Even I thought it was strange. I said, yeah, the school of learning high theory says there are countable models, but that's a fake. Sure, they're countable as viewed from the outside, but they're not really countable. You won't be able to use that. Well, it was a shock to me when I said, well, I said aha, that was the missing link, the missing piece in the puzzle, that they were countable. So all these things would have been wonderful to discuss with her, but uh, we never did. And the same thing, let me say, the other point that I would have liked to here, and to be totally honest, to feel that he would, he would be a little impressed with it, was that I don't feel I just worked on the independence of the continuum hypothesis. I did not, because my method eventually proved many, many results of that type. I was thinking about what the axioms were, and I would have liked to hear if he felt that Horsey gave a deeper understanding of what proof was. I think it does in some sense. I wouldn't want to push it too much, but it's been applied to fields that I never dreamed possible. So I think in some sense, 
we, we came full circle, but I came back to a syntactical point of view, so to speak, worrying about you know what can be proved using what. But in spirit, I feel I was supposed to, to school them. We thought about models. Uh, there's a wonderful comment in the collective works of Gerda, a review by Walt of a review of Gerda, the paper of Skolem, and he says, in which Skolem essentially discovered ultra filters or something very close to it. And he said, Skolem published a series of papers which were very well regarded at that time, but they look even better and better as time goes on. So Skolem is sort of my, I say, he's my own brother, if Gerda is my spiritual father. I would have loved to have discussed with Skolem, and I think he would have, he would have immediately felt in some sense, you know, that Jesus could have done this too, I don't know, you know, go in the right direction, as I, I, I sort of missed that. Anyhow, so I don't want to take up too much time now. In re summing up, I can say the visit to the Institute, when I gave her the paper, was one of the high points of my life. I can tell you another personal story. I sat there, and a mathematician I had met a year or two before sat next to me. He said to me, you know, you look like you're very hopped up for some such version. He said, I would take it easy because he said, I knew so-and-so when he did his big result, and it almost, he almost had a nervous breakdown. Oh, I didn't think I was that bad off, but I was in a strange state. I suddenly felt I understood things that no one had ever seen. So when I feel the kinship with Gerbil, it's partially that helping we travel down the same path. We thought about things that we were pretty sure nobody ever thought about. And, uh, you know, we were both depressed. We went through moments of gloom and despair. But eventually, <laughs> everything turned out very well. So here I am today, enjoying this wonderful conference, which far exceeded all my expectations. And I think I've even gotten through this talk. <laughs> so I was told Cy that I don't really want to answer questions, maybe because I don't want to discuss the personal things beyond what I said, but if it's someone I know who wants to ask me a simple question, I'm willing to answer, but I, you know, I don't want to discuss too many more personal things about her or about myself. Is there anyone, anyone who feels an absolutely overpowering need to raise his hand and 